All right, so we need to analyze and sketch the graph of f of x equals x squared plus 1 all over x squared minus 1. This is a rational function. Remember, with rational functions, the first thing you want to do before you do anything is find that domain. To find that domain, you always set the unsimplified denominator equal to 0. So do not simplify the fraction first. Set the denominator equal to 0. I'd add 1 to both sides, so I have x squared minus 1 equals 0. I add 1 to both sides, I have x squared equals 1. I take the square root of both sides. Do not forget plus or minus. So I'd have plus and minus 1. So that means really what we're saying is x cannot equal those numbers. So here's the number negative 1 and 1. Both of those are open circles, and I'm defined everywhere else. So it seems that the domain would have to be negative infinity to negative 1. Then we'd have the interval negative 1 to 1. Negative 1 to 1. And then we would have the interval 1 to infinity. Again, it's very important to know the domain of this function. What we've determined now is x equals negative 1 and x equals 1 cannot be maximums, minimums, inflection points, can't be anything. In fact, most likely what these are are vertical asymptotes or points where it's undefined. So after we found the domain of a rational function, now we want to try to simplify it. So look at this numerator. It's a sum of squares, which does not factor. But the denominator is a difference of squares, which does factor. It does not simplify at all, so we don't need to worry about that. Okay. So let's move on to the x-intercepts. Again, x-intercepts occur if you factored and simplified. Always factor and simplify first. And x-intercepts occur when the numerator equals 0. So I'm going to set x squared plus 1 equals to 0. I have x squared equals negative 1. I know that can't happen because I'd be taking the square root of a negative number. So that means there are no x-intercepts. This never crosses the x-axis. I'll go and write that now. None. So now let's go over to y-intercepts. For y-intercepts, you're always going to plug in x equals 0. See what you get. So I'd have 0 squared plus 1 over 0 squared minus 1, which is going to be 1 over negative 1, which is negative 1. So that tells me my y-intercept is the ordered pair. Well, the x value was 0 and the y value was negative 1. There's my y-intercept, 0, negative 1. We move on to vertical asymptotes. How do you find vertical asymptotes? Vertical asymptotes are clear when, once we factored and simplified. They occur when the denominator equals 0. So if I set the denominator equal to 0, I'm going to use the factored version of it. That'll make it easier for me. So x minus 1 equals 0 gives me x equals 1. And x plus 1 equals 0 gives me x equals negative 1. Notice I cannot write x equals negative 1 comma 1 because that would indicate these are numbers. These are not numbers. These are lines. So we have to write them as two separate lines. The vertical asymptotes here are x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. Again, two separate equations for two separate lines. The next thing we do is we do the horizontal asymptotes. We learned this in a previous section. To find horizontal asymptotes, what you're looking for is the end behavior. The limit is x goes to infinity or negative infinity. And this is where we do top heavy, bottom heavy, or balanced. If you look at this one, the degree in the numerator is the same as the degree in the denominator. So that's balanced. Anytime it's balanced, all you have to do is say it's y equals, take the leading term on top, divided by the leading term on bottom. In this case, it's x squared over x squared, which simplifies to 1. So y equals 1 is going to be our horizontal asymptote. So that's analyzing the original function. We have the domain split up at negative 1 and 1. We have no x-intercepts. Our y-intercepts are the point zero, 1. Vertical asymptotes are x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. Horizontal asymptotes are y equals 1. That's a lot of information to help us with the graphing of this function, again, without using any technology. So let's get even better. Let's look at... The intervals of increasing and decreasing in any relative extrema. I'm going to go ahead and write the function, the original function, down so I can zoom in. So I have x squared minus 1 over, or sorry, x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 1 is our original function. Again, this doesn't simplify. There's no little tricks that we can use, so we are going to need to use the quotient rule here. And the quotient rule for finding the derivative says it's the bottom, which is x squared minus 1, times the derivative of the top, which would be 2x minus the top, which is x squared plus 1, 
times the derivative of the bottom, which would be 2x, all over the bottom squared, so this would be x squared minus 1 quantity squared. Let's go ahead and do some simplification. I'll just FOIL this one out. So I would have, what would that be, 2x cubed minus 2x. Then I'd have a minus 2x cubed, and be careful with the negative here. I would have a minus 2x. I'm sorry, that was a 2x cubed. And this is all over x squared minus 1 quantity squared. Seems that my 2x cubes are going to be canceling on top. So I have the derivative of f prime of x equals, well, minus 2x minus 2x. I'm getting minus 4x. And that's all over x squared minus 1 quantity squared. So this looks like the nice simplified form of my derivative right here. There's no more factoring and simplifying, so that is what I'm going to be using. I need to find those critical values. Those critical values are when the derivative is equal to 0 or when the derivative is undefined. Again, a derivative is equal, a fraction is e equal to 0 when the numerator equals 0. So set the numerator equal to 0, negative 4x equals 0. Divide both sides by negative 4, you'd have x equals 0. To find out where it's undefined, any fraction is undefined when the denominator equals 0. So I have x squared minus 1 quantity squared equals 0. Take the square root of both sides, I'd have x squared minus 1 equals 0. Add 1 to both sides, I'd have x squared equals 1. I'd take the square root of both sides, don't forget plus or minus, and I have x equals negative 1 and 1. So if I notice, I have three kind of potential critical values of 0, negative 1, and 1, but here I know 0 is the only critical value because if you go back to the domain of the function, x equals negative 1 and x equals 1, those were the vertical asymptotes, so those cannot be maxes, mins, or inflection points. They are points where the actual function is undefined. So let's create that number line, and let's break it up at those three places we have. We have negative 1, 0, and 1. I know my derivative, f prime of x, is undefined at negative 1. It's 0 when it's equal to 0, and it's undefined when x equals 1. I look at those intervals. I have negative infinity to negative 1, negative 1 to 0, 0 to 1, and 1 to infinity, and I'm going to try to determine the behavior of my original function by looking at the sign of the first derivative. So I have my x values here. I'm going to be plugging them into my derivative, which we determined was negative 4x all over x squared minus 1 quantity squared. I need to pick one number in each of those four intervals and check the sign of it. So how about the number negative 10? negative 0.5 for the second one, 0 0.5 for the third one, and 10 for the last one. Any number in the interval works. Those are just the numbers that ISO chose. I'm also going to notice here that this is pretty easy to determine the sign of. Notice my bottom is squared, so no matter what I put in the denominator, I'm going to get a positive number. So really all I have to do is consider the numerator here. So negative 10, I'd have a negative times a negative, which is positive. And then a positive over a positive is positive, so that entire first interval must be positive. Negative 0.5, again, I'd have a negative times a negative, which is positive. Positive over a positive is positive, so that entire second interval is positive. At 0 0.5, I would have a negative times a positive, which is negative, over a positive is negative, so the entire third interval has to be negative. When I plug in 10, I'd have a negative times a positive, which is negative. A negative divided by a positive is negative, so the entire interval must be negative. So it looks like my function, anytime when my derivative's positive is increasing, anytime my derivative's negative is decreasing, my function must be increasing for the first two intervals and decreasing for the second two intervals. Remember that we have vertical asymptotes at x equals 1 and negative 1, so those can't be anything. But by the first derivative test, since I go from increasing to decreasing, I know when x equals 0, that's a maximum. Again, a maximum is an ordered pair. It's a point on a graph, so I do need to plug 0 into the original equation. But I had already done that previously when I determined the uh, y-intercept. When I plugged in 0, I got a negative 1. So that tells me that the point 0, negative 1 is a relative or local maximum.
So let's go ahead and look at the intervals of increasing, and it's very important that we don't put negative infinity to zero. We do need to break it up at each one of these intervals we see. So the intervals of increasing would be negative infinity to negative one and negative one to zero. Again, you cannot say negative infinity to zero because you would be telling me that the function is increasing at negative one and the function's not even defined at negative one. So make sure you break that up. Where's this function decreasing? It would be decreasing on 0 to 1 and 1 to infinity. Likewise, we could not say 0 to infinity here because this function is not decreasing when x equals 1 because it's not even defined when x equals 1. For our maximum, we found a maximum at the point 0, negative 1, and our minimum, there is none.